church. I'm glad to see you this morning. Let's all stand and we're going to invite the presence of the Lord in the house today. Father, we love you and we glorify your name. We thank you that you brought us together today and you have brought us through another week. You are good and we magnify you and we bless you in this house and we lift you up because you're worthy and you're holy. And we thank you for your presence today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air. How glad are you and me, joy. Join the song with them we shall be. Praising Christ through ages long, heaven's jubilee. And oh, what, what singing, oh, what, what shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, holy hallelujah. When we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. Sing it again, sing it. Oh, what, what singing. Shouting all that happy morning when we all shout out. 
a God who's not dead, but he's alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. God knows that uh, he, he knows his timing. He knows the seasons. Come on. And I believe that we're in the season where we're not going to be long on this earth, but we're going to see him in the air. Amen. And the Bible said that uh, we will forever be with him. Amen. And so I still believe in the rapture of the church. There's not many that believe that anymore, but I tell you what, I still believe that there is a coming where God is going to snatch us out of here, all right? And that the trumpet's going to sound. The ones who are dead, they're going to rise first, and we that are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up to be seized quickly in the twinkling of an eye, amen? At the last trump of God. Thank the good Lord. Well, I'm so glad to see you. So many beautiful faces here this morning on a cold Sunday morning. Amen. But God is so good, and he has been so good to us. He's provided for our every need this week. He has provided us with strength and health and life. And uh, I'm glad David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I've never dreaded coming to church one day in my life. Because I love the Lord and I love to worship Him. Amen. And I know you do too. And that's why you're here. And uh, we're just glad that you are here. As far as announcements are concerned, you can look at your bulletin and uh, see everything that is upcoming this week and throughout the rest of the month. Uh, and online, we're so glad that our uh, church is with us online. Let's give them a big God bless you this morning. We love y'all. So glad that you're joining us this morning. And uh, you can go on the website and look and see all the announcements and everything that's going on. Uh, next week is Thanksgiving already. Isn't that crazy? Is it next week? It is next week, isn't it? So um, anyway, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we will not have any services at all. So we just kind of want to make sure that you know that. That's going to help all of you ladies get prepared and gentlemen get prepared for the next day. And so uh, we're giving you that Wednesday night off as we normally do, and that's our custom. And so uh, we, uh, any other announcements you'll have there in your bulletin. And I understand that Danielle has uh, something that she wants to say. Danielle, you can come up and greet the people until your pastor comes back in. <laughs> Well, good morning. Wouldn't it be just like our pastor to have to make your grand entrance? 
Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and uh, my ushers will prepare and we're going to receive the morning tithes and offering this morning. And isn't the Lord good? Don't we serve a good God this morning? And not only is he good this morning, but he's good all of the time. So we're just going to pray over the offering this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this day, Father, that you have given us. And I thank you, Father, that as we pre prepare our offerings, Father, this morning, that you bless us. And I thank you, Father, that as we prepare our offerings this morning, Lord, that those blessings, Father, will be returned 30, 60, and 100-fold, Father. And I thank you, Father, that we don't give out of being stingy, but we give bountifully and plentiful this morning, Lord. And we thank you, Father, that it's an honor and a privilege that we get to glorify you in that manner and worship you this morning with our giving. And we just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. So now that Pastor Jimmy is back in <laughs> this morning, you did have to make a disappearance when I needed you. But I hear that we have a birthday, that we had a birthday on the 11th. And so this morning we want to, the 10th, the 10th or 11th, the 10th, I got it wrong. See, I already messed up. I'm so sorry. So Pastor Jimmy, if you'll come forth this morning. We want to honor our pastor this morning. He's not getting any younger, but in saying that, he's going to have more energy in the years to come to be able to pastor our people this morning. So we just want to wish you a very happy birthday, and I won't get it wrong ever again. I'm so sorry. So we want to say happy birthday to our pastor, and we love you. At this time, we actually have a, a video that we're going to play. Hey, Pastor. Thanks for seeing me. This is so great. I have been wanting to talk to you for quite a while, and um, to be right here with you right now is awesome. Does it look like I have an appointment? Being the children's minister, uh, first the good news, because who doesn't like good news? <laughs> Listen, I've been looking at the numbers, and we are hurting, all right? We are bleeding with a capital blee, okay? I know you've been wanting to talk to me, but being the youth minister, I'm really busy, okay? I'm doing a lot, a lot of stuff. But as building superintendent of this here church, I got a problem. Singles ministry, it ain't working. No one's coming. You know it, and I know it. There's only one thing I think this church is missing. Snakes. I just really need to confess to you, my pastor, that the Ten Commandments, I've done all of them. Okay, I've committed all of them, okay? Except murder. I am the chairman of the deacons of this church. This weekend we're doing a lie, junior high lock-in. That is a great concept, isn't it? I mean, whoever thought of that, I mean, you know what I'm saying? What if we rent out the left side of our auditorium to that new hipster church, huh? Here's my letter of resignation. I'm going back to work at Starbucks because they give benefits. The good news is, with VBS, um, we had so many kids involved and 17 kids came to know the Lord. Yay. I was here long before you got here. <laughs> um, the bad news is we've lost one of them, um, Timmy. And I'll be here long after you're gone. I need you to have my back, okay? I need you to have my back because, I mean, the seniors, they are, they are on me. Not my senior high class, but the senior citizens, they do not like me. We're not using it. You're not going to fill it up with your messages. And here's the simple truth. That could help us out. What do you say? Hip, 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 stir away? Get out of yourself. Just get out of yourself. How about we let Carl here loose on some of our congregants? See who's without sin and who's not, huh? I'm sure this happens a lot in churches, doesn't it? No. Okay. Okay. No. And by the way, I can't get that smell out of the band. <laughs> so just have my back, okay? I'm really, really trying. I got a lot on my plate. Do, do you see that? God has been talking to me really big time. And I think he wants me to preach. Adios, muchacho. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Carl. Oh, Carl's out. 
thorough tap. No hard feelings? Don't mind if I do. Thank you, sir. Oh. Is that cigarette? You need to get right with the Lord or get out of here, because that snake's poisonous. I'm not kidding. Carl! <laughs> So at this time, I also want Pastor Jimmy and Melissa both to come to the platform. So as you know, we're this is where we are going to do pastor's appreciation this morning. Don't we love our pastors? Yes, go ahead and stand up and give them... So a pastor's work is never ending. It never stops. Never stops at night, and never you never sometimes get a sleepful night because you're always thinking, what can I do next? How can I make this congregation stronger in the word? So it's never ending. And they experience the pressure and the tension that we, if not greater, they experience it so much more than we even do. And you know, a pastor is not only called to be a pastor, but a pastor is called to, to be involved in all of our lives. And that's a, a tremendous burden that they have to face. Because not only do they have their own burdens, they have to feel the burdens that we carry as well. So we should take the time to pray for our pastors every day of our lives. So that way they can be strengthened. So that way they can feel the peace and the strength of the Lord every day of their life. And it says in Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, And now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who worked so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. And let's overwhelm them with love and appreciation this morning. So we want to say thank you for being our pastors. Thank you for the sleepless nights, for the times that we've needed you the most. And I can say, that's me right here. They've walked all my journeys with me, and we just want to say we honor you, we love you, we appreciate you, and we just know your best years are ahead. You all are just beginning. This is milestone years for you all, and I just believe that you all are just beginning, and we are so thrilled that God has placed such a strong anointing on your lives and that we get to experience that here at New Life, that we get to have you the most. The world gets to experience you, but we get to have you here the most. And we just love and we appreciate you all. And also, they have an anniversary, too, this week. So let's just say happy anniversary, too. Thank you so much. I wasn't expecting that today. And uh, the video, that was so cute. I think we've experienced most of them. But God is so good. We love you all. We love you like family. And we mean that. We say that, but we actually mean that. And uh, you are family. And we've been here for uh, for so many years. And, and Jimmy's been with us 20 years. We've been married uh, 30 years tomorrow. I guess it's tomorrow. 30 years tomorrow. Yep. So Jimmy's been with, we've been here 20 years together. And, uh, but here, I've been here all of my life. I was a year and a half when dad took the church. So you are my home and I love you. And I'm just looking forward to see what God's going to do for you and your families in the days to come. Amen. God is so good. Will you stand and let's just begin to worship him because he is good that's the whole reason that we come is to worship him and thank him for all that he's done can you just begin to put your mind on the Lord this morning hallelujah Jesus we thank you for your mercy and your grace we thank you for the many years God that you have been faithful to us here at New Life 
and into all of our lives individually. You are a good God and we give you all the praise that you deserve. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to your name. We love you. We love you. And we thank you for cleansing us. We thank you for washing us. We thank you, Lord, that you brought us into your kingdom. We have privilege in the kingdom of sons and daughters. And we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be yours. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus.
begin to love on him and praise him in your own way this morning. Your name is beautiful. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we love you today and we thank you for your presence that we feel in this place. And Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Surely there's none like unto him. You've given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, Father, we confess him as Lord here in this place. He is Lord, and beside him there is none other. And, Father, we love you and we magnify you in this place, and we exalt you, sir. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering in this place here this, this morning. Amen. Amen. Isn't the Lord good? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John, John chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I want to express my gratitude to all of you for, yes, the kids are dismissed for Children's Church. Let's hear it for our children here this morning. Amen. Amen. But I want to express my gratitude to all of you for the birthday gift, the, uh, the pastor appreciation gift. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege to, to be here and to be uh, your pastor and to work with you to see the kingdom of God advanced in this area. Amen. John chapter 5, starting with verse 1. It says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately 
the man was made a whole and took up his bed and walked, and on that same day was the Sabbath. I want to draw your attention once again to verses 3 and 4. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, and withered, waiting for the moving, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, stirred the water, and whosoever then first, after the troubling or the stirring of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. I'm going to continue on my series this morning of it's time to stir it up. It's time to stir it up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this day that you've given us. God, I thank you for your children that are here. And Father, I pray that you just open our eyes to your word and open our hearts to your word to receive the seed of God that is sown forth today. May it be sown upon good soil that it may bring forth some 30, some 60, some 100-fold return. And Father, we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to stir it up. Look at somebody else and say, it's time to stir it up. And as I've been preaching on this over the past couple of, of Sundays, we know that an angel came at a certain season and stirred up the waters for the miraculous to take place. The angel would stir the water, and then the Bible said that the first one who would step into the water was miraculously healed. But there was a stirring before in this environment. This angel came and stirred the waters. He created an environment that was conducive for the supernatural power of God to move. And as I've been stating over the past couple of weeks, in a similar way, we need to stir the water for the miraculous power of God to move. We need to stir up an environment that is conducive for the power of God to be in operation in our midst. How many of you realize that we play a part in the stirring? As I talked about uh, in a previous message in 2 Timothy 1, 1 through 7, Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift of God which was in him. God gives the gifts, but it's our responsibility to stir those gifts up. If it wasn't our responsibility, Paul would have never told Timothy to stir up the gift of God which is within you. So the stirring is our responsibility. Somebody say the stirring is our responsibility. And so folks, if we want to see the supernatural power of God move. How many of you want to see that? How many of you have been in churches where, where your life has been changed because you got in an environment where the power of God was manifested? I've told you many times of my healing testimony, how that my kidneys were deformed and diseased from birth and how that, uh, you, you know the story better than I do. You've heard it so many times. But I was in an environment where a pastor, Pastor Jerry Long, allowed the Spirit of God to move. The church, got in, they, they began to stir up an environment through prayer and through seeking God and the zeal for the things of God, that it began to stir up an environment for the supernatural power of God to begin to move. And I submit to you today, that's what we need more of. Because the Holy Ghost can do more in two seconds than any preacher can do in two hours. The Holy Ghost can do more in two seconds than, than a politician could ever do. The Holy Ghost could do more in two seconds than the best counselor could ever do. Folks, What we've been going everywhere else for help. We will go to this counselor for help, and we'll go to, to Dr. Phil for help, and we'll go to Dr. Seuss for help. How many of you know? But it's time that we go to Dr. Jesus because everybody else is a practicing physician, but Jesus is still the great physician. Can somebody give him praise in this place? I'm telling you 
that it's time that we stir up an environment that is conducive for the Spirit of God to move. Well, how do we do that? We talked about prayer, how that prayer is so important to, to creating an environment that's conducive for the manifestation of the power of God because Scripture tells us that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The word rewarder in the Greek means a remunerator, one who pays a wage. So when we diligently seek God, then the Bible says that God Almighty will pay the wage. Aren't you glad that God still pays the wage for those who work in prayer? When we diligently begin to seek God, God Almighty will pay the wage. And what is the wage that he will pay? Well, whatever we're seeking. If we're diligently seeking him, that means he will reward us with him. And when we get God, you've got all the provision you need need. When you get God, you've got all the healing you need. When you get God, you got all the peace you need. Come on, somebody. When you get God, you got everything you need. All of the riches of the glories of, uh, of heaven are yours. The opened windows and the blessings of heaven are yours when you get him. And the scripture tells us there is a way that we can be rewarded with him where God will pay the wage and that is when we diligent seek God. Show me a church that will diligently seek God and I will show you a church that's stirring up the waters for the supernatural power of God to be manifested in their midst. Can somebody say amen in this house? We talked about that. We talked about desire where scripture talked about covet earnestly the best gifts. That covet, covet earnestly. Zeluo in the Greek which means to burn with zeal towards those things, to, to desire earnestly, to pursue, to strive after. You see, the proof of passion is pursuit. Tomorrow, Melissa and I will be married 30 years. That's why we're not going to have uh, our revived service tonight because I'm going to be taking that woman to Gatlinburg. Amen taking her down to Gatlinburg. Any woman that have put up with me for 30 years really deserves a trip to Rome. Who said amen? Ushers, escort Teresa, out we? Any woman that put up with me for 30 years deserves a trip to Rome and Paris, Jerusalem, any other place, Hawaii, any other place you can think of. The Bahamas, Grand Cayman Islands, anything. But I'm going to be taking her to Gatlinburg, right? So, uh, so that's what we're going to be doing. But the, the reason why we've been married for 30 years is because at one time I pursued her. The proof of passion is pursuit. And so here's what I did. I remember the first time my brother came home and he met her a year before I did. And so he said, Jimmy, I met your wife tonight. One year, he met her one time at a Bible conference, came home and he said, I met your wife tonight. My brother David, and that carried a lot of weight with me because David had been like a, a father figure to me since my dad passed away when I was 15, a mentor to me. So he said, I met your wife tonight. He said, you just trust me. You go up to Joplin, pack her up, and bring her home because I met your wife. Well, that carried a lot of weight with me. Well, I was a young preacher, and I wanted to marry the right one. Come on, somebody. You don't want just anybody. You want the God person for you, right? And so for an entire year, I began to investigate. Call different people, ask about Melissa Roberts. How, what kind of girl is she? Is she a good girl? And I'd call different people. Different girls would call me, and I'd ask them if they knew her. And so we began talking, and so for an entire year, she was always in the Pentecostal Church of God Messenger magazine doing something with the college. So I was keeping up. You know, just watching from a distance to see if this is someone that I wanted to truly pursue. And so it seemed like, you know, she was passing the test. And so one day I called the, at that time was the, uh, the general youth president and his wife. And so his wife answered the phone and I said, hey, tell me a little bit about Melissa Roberts. And, and so Kay Redding said this. She said, Jimmy, you won't believe this, but even today 
Phil and I were talking about, you know, who would make Jim a good wife, Melissa Roberts. And so here all of this was going on in the background. So, so uh, here I go up and finally meet her. No, I, I saw her at the Bible conference came around again a year later. So I went as a young preacher, standing at the door, handing out my cards, wanting to find some place to preach. So I was up on the platform. I was playing music, playing the bass. And here she comes in in the back door because her best friend's brother was preaching the meeting. So she come in with Melody Hooley, and so I saw her at a distance. I knew who she was, but she had no clue who I was for a year, okay? So here I was. Man, I couldn't hardly swallow. My, my palms were sweating. I was getting all nervous. And so after service, she came up to play the piano, and so I was on the bass, and so I was so nervous, I couldn't hardly talk to her. The only thing I could ask her was, what key are you in? That's it. And y'all know I like to talk. But I said, what key are you in? And she said, D. And I, that's all we said that night. But then what was something was in January of that year, she had been praying. The Holy Ghost told her to go to her dorm room and to begin to pray for her husband. Not pray for a husband, but to begin to pray for her husband. And she said when she saw me at that Bible conference, the Holy Ghost said, that's the guy. That's the guy. And so here my brother had already told me she's the gal. But now the Holy Ghost told her that I was the guy. And so then I went up to commencement at Messenger College. She was there. And so my mother had been the dorm mother uh, at, the, at the college previously. So we went up and some of the kids were graduating that my mother and I knew. And so I saw Melissa. And so then I began to pursue. I got a little bit, <laughs> I got up, I, I conjured up a little bit more um, courage, all right, nerves as somebody said. So she was there and we all went out to eat afterward and I began to talk to her and I said, so you're from Kentucky. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, you know, I hear there's a lot of good things come from Kentucky. I said, there's the Kentucky Wildcats. I said, they're good. I said, there's the Kentucky Rifle. That's good. There, that time there was a, a group called the Kentucky Headhunters. And I said, they're good. And I said, and then there's my personal favorite, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I said, I'm just wondering, baby, are you original or extra crispy? <laughs> and she married me anyway, folks. She married me anyway. But my point is this. We've been married tomorrow for 30 years. On this platform for 30 years, the proof of passion is pursuit. Whatever you want, you will pursue. And folks, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we want God enough to really pursue him? Do we want the supernatural power of God enough to really pursue him? Do we want to see the, the gifts of the Spirit in operation so much that we really desire and pursue them? You see, you, are, you will never possess what you are unwilling to pursue. You will never possess what you are unwilling to pursue. The proof of passion is pursuit. And I don't know about you here this morning, but I've made up my mind that I'm going to pursue God. I've made up my mind I'm going to pursue his presence. I'm going to pursue his gifts. I'm going to pursue his power. Because everybody in the world's tried everything else. They've gone to this one and that didn't work. And so they went to that one and that didn't work. They've gone from this relationship to that relationship and it didn't work. They've gone from that job to this job that didn't work. And so people are all around the world pursuing things that aren't working for them. That's not satisfying them. That's not fulfilling them in their life. But I submit to you today, if we would just diligently pursue God, God would show up in our lives and he is the only 
only one who can truly give you satisfaction and the one who can only truly give you fulfillment. And I submit to you today, we've tried everything else. Why isn't it time for us to go ahead and try Jesus, try the power of God, try his gifts? Because when we do, he will supply everything that we need. Can somebody say amen? So we talked about desire. We talked about how that they, when they had ministered unto the Lord in Acts chapter 13, the Holy Ghost said, attending church is more than just us coming to be ministered to. And that's why some people don't come to church because they think, I'm good. I'm living in the United States of America. I'm good. I've got plenty to eat. I've got a car. I've got a house. I've got a job. I've got this. I've got that. I'm all good. And so that's why some people don't attend church because they think, I'm good. I really don't need to go. And the reason why is because we're seeing only one side of the equation. We're seeing only one side of the coin. We're thinking about somebody ministering to us, God ministering to us. But there is another side of the equation. There is another side of the coin. And Acts chapter 13 says that as they ministered unto the Lord. Come on, somebody. As they ministered unto the Lord, the Holy Ghost showed up and he had something to say. And I submit to you today when we begin thinking on the other side of the coin, when we begin to think on the other side of the equation, we will realize that there's more than just us coming to church to be ministered to. We are coming together and gathering together in one place, in one mind, in one accord, not only to be ministered to, but to minister unto the Lord. And when we begin to get to that place where we begin to minister unto the Lord, the Holy Ghost will show up and he will begin to speak. He will begin to touch. He will begin to change lives. Why? Because we have stirred up an environment that is conducive for his presence. Amen. Somebody say amen. Now, I want you to turn with me. We're going to look at another way that we can stir up. We've talked about praise and worship. We've talked about prayer. We've talked about desire. I want to talk about belief for a minute. Look with me. There's so much to say. Let's go to Mark 6. I tell you what, I'm just having fun already. I don't know about you, but I'm having a great time. Belief. You'll stir up an environment by believing for big things. Let me try this crowd. All right, let me try this crowd. No, I'm playing. When we believe God will stir up an environment for the miraculous power of God to move. When we do not have belief but unbelief, we're going in the opposite direction. And I want you to see it in Mark. Mark chapter 6 Verses 1 through 6. It says, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? The son of Mary, the brother of James. Familiarity breeds content. Let me say it again. Familiarity breeds content. Many times we can go to a place, if people are too familiar with you, sometimes it, you, they'll, you'll lose the, the true power of being able to minister to those people. And in verse 2 it says, is not this the carpenter? 
the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were what? Offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. Why? Because familiarity many times breeds contempt. Verse 5, notice this. And he could there do no mighty work. I want you to see that. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God incarnate in the flesh, and he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. But what? And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. Notice that. Notice that. Now let's go to Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, 53 through 58. Matthew 13, 53 through 58. It says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, and so much that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother Mary and his brother James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. Him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many works there. Why? Are you all with me now? And he did not many works there because of their unbelief. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying belief will stir up an environment for the mighty works of God to be manifested in our midst. Jesus, God incarnate, God in the flesh, he could do their no mighty work because of their unbelief. So unbelief works just the opposite of belief. Unbelief will stir up something else, but it's not going to be the power of God. Because it was their lack of belief in God. It was their unbelief that Jesus could do no mighty work there. And I submit to you, Jesus is not going to do a mighty work here. If we don't believe him for it. If we don't believe that he's still able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Folks, I'm telling you, it's time that we believe God for big things. We need people to get healed of cancer and sickness and disease. We got to believe God for big things. There are people, marriages that need to be put back together. It's time for us to believe God for big things. People need financial breakthroughs in their life. It's time for us to believe God for big things because if we were to come in here and if we would start believing God for big things and believe that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask, ask or think according to the power that works within us, then we would begin to see the mighty works of God manifested in our midst. And I want to know if there's anybody in this house that says, I'm hungry for that. I'm ready to see the supernatural power of God move. I'm tired of just talking about what Jesus used to do because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And honey, I come in here to let you know know if he ever was a healer he's still a healer if he ever was a savior he's still a savior if he ever was a deliverer he is still a deliverer I want to know if there's anybody in this house that'll raise your hands and say I believe God I believe him to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within, within us 
So the environment there in Mark and in Matthew was not conducive for a mighty move of God. Why? Because of their unbelief. You see, an atmosphere of belief is mandatory if we want to see a mighty work of God. Now let's go to Mark 5. Let's go to Mark 5 very quickly. Mark 5, let's continue on with this thought. Let's look at it again. Mark chapter 5. Somebody say, we got to believe God for big things. Mark chapter 5, starting with verse 35. It says, while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, thy daughter is dead. Your daughter's dead. Why trouble thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, how many of you know Jesus still hears the words that come out of your mouth? Hung by the tongue. Come on. I can prove to you that the dictionary is wrong. I can prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that the the dictionary is wrong because it says the dumb can't speak. Y'all get it in a minute. Y'all get it. Dumb speak all the time. As soon as he heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. (laughs) What are you facing? What are you facing? Brother Jimmy, I'm facing a physical condition in my life that the doctors gave up on me, Brother Jimmy. You know what I got to say to you today? Be not afraid, only believe. What are you facing? Well, Brother Jimmy, you know I'm facing financial ruin. You know what I got to say to you? Be not afraid, only believe. Say, well, it looks like my marriage is on the rocks. We're never going to be able to recover. I'm never going to achieve anything. We're never going to do anything. My, My statement to you is this. Be not afraid, only believe. And notice what Jesus said. Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult. Somebody say, he saw the tumult. He saw the chaos. Now I want you to think about that. Let's just look, what did he see? And them that wept and wailed greatly. No belief, not believing God for anything. They come in here giving a negative report. Jesus said, don't listen to that. Don't be afraid. You just believe. Now notice in all these people, Jesus comes into the house and there's this great tumult. tumult, And they, they wept and they wailed greatly. You can just imagine, oh! And that's what happens to us and people around us. Ah! You know, there's no belief, no believing in God, nothing. They've already given up on you. They've already given up on your marriage. They've already given up on your health. They've already given up on your job. They've already given up on your bit. They've already given up. And you can tell they gave up by the way that they're acting. Ah! Why? Can you imagine the whole house full of them? The Bible says there was a tumult. And they cried and wept greatly. Can you imagine? That's just me making all this noise. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a whole house full? Why? What did Jesus do? When Jesus walked in, what did he do? Verse 39. And when he was come in, he saith unto him, 
why make you this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead but sleepeth, and they laughed him to scorn. Why? Jesus comes in. Why are you making this a do? Because the damsel's dead. Jesus said, she, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. So they go from this. <laughs> I mean, these people were nuts. You talk about bipolar, boy. <laughs> I mean, these people were absolute nuts, man. Go from the weeping and all this ado and all this chaos and all this tumult in the house, tearing everything up and slobbering over everything. Jesus comes in and says, why are you weeping? Why are you making this big ado? And they say, because she's dead. Jesus said, she's not dead, she sleeps. And then they turn around and start laughing him to scorn. So what happened at that point? And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, sometimes you just got to look at somebody and say, you got to go, boo. If you can't, oh, I'm about to preach now. Come on now, I don't need anybody to go ahead and put me in the grave. I need for somebody to believe God with me. I need for somebody to take a hold of the horns of the altar with me. I need for somebody to stand on the promises of God's word for me. I need for somebody to say, yeah, I know, oh, come on somebody, I know what the doctor said, but he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with with his stripes, he was healed. When my brother had a third of his stomach cavity filled with cancer, I said, no, brother, we're not going to just go ahead and let you go. I'm going to stand in the gap with you. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to stand on the promises of God for you. And you know what? My brother is cancer-free right now. You know why? Because somebody believed God to do the exceeding abundantly above all that we can have somebody give him praise in this place. It was an environment that wasn't conducive for the miraculous power of God. So Jesus said, you got to go. Is everybody seeing this now? You play a part and stirring up an atmosphere, a belief, stirring up an atmosphere that is conducive for the power of God to be manifested in our midst. There was no belief in there at all. They were crying, weeping, making a big ado, as Jesus said. There was a tumult in the house. Jesus come in and had something to say, and they laughed him to scorn. But honey, oh, come on. People been looking at you, and you've been coming to church and saying, I believe in God. They've been laughing you to scorn. You've been believing for a miracle. They've been laughing you to scorn. You've been believing for provision. They've been laughing you to scorn but I come in here to let you know Jesus is going to get the last laugh it doesn't matter the laugh that the enemy puts in your face Jesus is the one that's going to get the last laugh and he's going he's laughing right now because he knows he's still God he still has the power to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think he's just looking for an atmosphere where people will begin to believe him for God When he put them all out. Why? Why didn't Jesus just go ahead and go on in there and heal her anyway? Because the atmosphere was an atmosphere of unbelief. Everybody's seeing it now. The atmosphere was an atmosphere of defeat, fear. We already gave up. 
So instead of Jesus coming in there, why didn't he move? Because of the principle we saw in Matthew and Mark. He could there do no mighty work because of their unbelief. He had to get them out. And create an environment that's conducive. That's why sometimes you can grow by subtraction. I'm going to say it again. Sometimes you can grow by subtraction. I'd rather have 30 people who believe God than 30,000 who don't. Because I was healed in the church about 30, 40, 50 people. But they believed God. And God showed up and God showed out. Are you with me? So Jesus said, you got to go. Get out. When he put them all out, he didn't ask them out. When he put them all out, I can just see him right now. <laughs> and Jesus comes up and grabs him by the shirt. <laughs> Boom. Somebody over here. <laughs> Jesus comes and grabs him by the shirt. You got to go too. Bang! Somebody over here laughing him to scorn. <laughs> and Jesus, <laughs> come with me. <laughs> you got to go too. Bang! And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, when he put them all out, Got to create this environment that's conducive for the power of God. Got to create this environment that's conducive for healing. I, they got to go. I got to put them out. He taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted. Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. <laughs> Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And that's what I'm saying to you today. Jesus is looking at your situation and he's saying, Damsel, I say unto you, arise. Arise out of your depression. Arise out of the funk that you've been living in. Arise out of that unbelief. Arise out of that fear. Arise out of all of that junk that's been weighing on you and, and keeping you down and keeping you oppressed and keeping you depressed. I'm telling you, it's time for you to put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Damsel, arise. Damsel, arise. The power of Jesus. One word from Jesus can change your situation around. It don't matter who's crying over you. It don't matter who's laughing at Jesus and laughing him to scorn, thinking Jesus don't do that anymore. See, you who come to a Pentecostal church that believes that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But you see, you go talking about all this kind of stuff in another type of church, then what do they do? They'll sit there and laugh this preacher to scorn. They'll sit there and laugh you to scorn. But here's what I got to say. Laugh all you want to, baby, but you got to go because Jesus is going to show up and he's going to show out and he's going to change my situation around. Damsel, damsel, arise. Hallelujah. Give him a praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody right here ought to just throw your hands up right now because you know he's in the room. <laughs> he's in the room. 
He's in this house. Come on, somebody. He's in this house and unbelief's got to go. Doubt and fear's got to go. He is in this house and he's still saying, damsel, arise. And he took the damsel by the hand <laughs> and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway, the damsel arose. And straightway, the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. Folks, I'm here to tell you that he's still the same Jesus. He's still the same Jesus. Will we believe him for big things? Or are we going to laugh all this to scorn? Are we going to laugh at all to scorn? Or are we just going to wail and put on the biggest tumult you've ever seen whenever we get bad news? I'm telling you, fear, unbelief, wailing, tumult, the laugh of scorn has got to go out of the house if we want to see the miraculous power of God move in our midst. Can somebody give him praise for it here this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's all stand. There's more I could say. I'll get to that next time. Because we're going somewhere. We're going to believe God for supernatural things to take place. Lottie. It's good to see your daughter here today. Give me a high five, darling. We just prayed for her on Wednesday night, didn't we? A couple Wednesday nights ago. And God's already touched her and turned her situation around. I wish I had somebody to help me. I said there's no signs of it anymore. There's no signs of it anymore. And you know, Lottie used to be one of them Baptists. And I want to say this, I love my Baptist friends, and I've got a lot of them. But Lottie was one of those old school Baptists used to sit right over here on the second row where Danielle's sitting. See a shout and she'd laugh us to scorn, wouldn't you, Lottie? You'd laugh, carry on. Oh, my goodness, did you see? Look, oh, my. She'd laugh and laugh and not. But now she's right here weeping when she tells of the supernatural power of God. And now you're Pentecostal all the way now, aren't you, darling? Why? Because she, no, come on, somebody. She's seen the supernatural power of God. Amen. Amen. Let's believe God for big things. Right now with every head bowed. Father, I pray that there is an atmosphere of expectancy in this place. For an atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles, according to Oral Roberts, who's seen many miracles. An atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles. And God, I pray that this is a place of belief. Father, that we're believing in you. We're believing in you. So many times we put our faith in faith. But God, help us to realign that and make sure that we're putting our faith in you. Because you are the healer. You're the provider. You're the one, God, that still changes situations. People will tell us that you just don't do it anymore. 
You don't do miracles anymore. You don't do those things anymore. But God, I'm so grateful for your word that tells us that you're still the same. I don't see where you quit loving people anymore. I don't read in your word where it says that your mercy is not for us anymore. I don't read in your word where it says that you, there's no compassion of God for us anymore. The same God of love and mercy and compassion still sits upon the throne of the universe. And God, I still thank you for the miraculous. That is a result of your love for people. That is a result of your mercy for people. That is a result of your compassion for people. And even as you touched Lottie's daughter to where they did the colonoscopy and said it's not there anymore. It was your love, your mercy, and your compassion that did it. Now, Father God, for every person that's in here, if you need a touch from God right now, where you are, I want you to raise your hands to heaven. If you need a healing, if you need financial provision, if you need a breakthrough, if you need a breakthrough for somebody else, whatever you need, I want. if you're here and you've got a need, I want you to raise your hands to heaven right now.